八点五十分，呃，第一阶段的会议会在早晨的九点三十分呃召开。那么届时呢，呃，中国国家主席胡锦涛以及其他各国政要都会发表重要的讲话。那么第二阶段的会议呢，会在下午的两点钟开始进行。那么到了下午的四点钟左右的会议就呃基本结束。届时呢，会议会有呃一些成果以文件的形式发布出来。呃，我们相信这个成果一定是令人期待的，也是对全球经济的进一步复苏啊、呃、有着非常积极的作用的。那么。呃，在这个会议当中呢，我觉得几个特别值得关注的话题啊，除了刚才我们呃节目当中北京演博士提到的之外呢，还有一个就是呃从这个 G 八向 G 二零的转变哈、啊，从这个八国峰会向这个二十国峰会转变，把这个二十国峰会作为全球最重要的一个多边的协调呃经济和金融机制的这样一种形态固化下来、制度化下来。那么早些时候呢，呃，我们也是探讨了一个非常严肃的话题，也是今天可能在这个 G 二零的领导人峰会上最重要的一个话题，就是贸易保护主义。我现在手里拿着呢是。一期最新的啊 ，G 二零峰会之前最新出版的一期这个呃《经济学家》杂志啊，我们可以看到这本杂志的这个封面上写着啊，呃，叫做“破坏主义”。那么呢，上面有一个上面写着“中国制造自由贸易的一个轮胎”，这个轮胎上面扎了一根呃螺丝刀，这个螺丝刀上面画着美国的国旗。啊，意思呢是美国呢把这个中国这个轮胎给扎瘪了，旁边呢是奥巴马总统的背影，上面写着美国针对中国的疯狂的贸易战。呃，我们可以看到。这个非常有意思啊！这个伦敦 G 二零峰会四月份峰会时候，最后最新当时的一期杂志上面写的是“中国人眼中的世界”，而这个到了呃这个几个月之后哈、啊，这次匹兹堡峰会的这个杂志的封面就变成了“美国针对中国的贸易战”。那么这个时候，我觉得这个话题呢，呃，俨然已经成为了会议当中大家最关注的焦点之一。那么就这个话题，我们也请我们的特约的评论员艾利森给我们做一些呃评论。So Alison, it seems that even the Western media, American media, has now Uh, been very critical and very negative on President Obama's decision to levy the additional tariff on Chinese-made tires. Yeah, it's unusual for the media. 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 的这个关税，他是希望呢能够把这创造更多的就业的机会，而且的话呢，呃，现在的话呢，美国的这种就业的机会呢，对他来说是非常的重要的。他是现在呢，可以说呢，是想为后面的这些政府呢留下一个遗产，而且的话呢，更重要的就是说、呃，他除了这点之外呢，创造就业之外呢，还希望能够通过这个医改。那么在这个方面呢，他是希望获得这个全民的支持，他必须要获得我们的这些工会的这个支持，才能通过他的这个医改。的计划，这也是为什么所谓的他向这个工会屈服了。也就是说呢，这些工会呢，他是希望卖出更多美国的这个轮胎，所以的话呢，对他来说呢，这一点是很重要。他是希望呢，呃，美这个美国的工会是希望美国的公民能够更多的买美国的这个轮胎，所以的话，在这个方面可能要打压一下中国，以便呢获得工会的支持来通过他的医改的方案。所以呢，这就意味着他可能要用这个特保案来获得相应的支持。正如艾利森所说啊，那么我们在这个问题上的观点，其实也是正如我们目前手上拿到的这个会刊啊，这次 G 二零峰会目前唯一的一个文件 ，G 二零峰会的会刊上面，戈登布朗首相也是奥巴马总统的好朋友所说的那样，贸易保一保护主义到了最后呢，是谁也保护不了。那么就贸易保护主义这个话题呢，我在早些时候也是独家专访了新任的美国驻华大使，美国犹他州的前州长洪波培，呃，这也是呢洪波培就任呃美国的新任驻华大使以来首次接受呃电视媒体的专访，呃。同时呢，也是美国政府首次对中美轮胎特保案做出公开的表态。我们一起来看。In the fact, you were the former deputy USTR. So, would you consider、uh, the tire case, the the tariff imposed on Chinese、uh, low-cost tires, an act of、uh, protectionism? Where we can take that issue, we can compartmentalize it and deal with it as trade experts, while allowing all of the other issues. To remain on the horizon,、uh, where concerns and questions about the trade case don't spill over, in other words, and taint the rest of the relationship. It's been a bilateral relationship for the last 30 years. Now, it's gone well beyond that. Now, it is a global relationship. So, all of the issues that we've discussed rather passionately, we now have to put in global terms and in a global context. And realize that decisions that are made between the United States and China 
reverberate in all corners of the world as opposed to just in Beijing and Washington. And if people can sit back and take and, 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 and keep that in mind, that there's a big picture relationship here that is developing, and I think they'll be more apt to want to thoroughly understand uh, the implications of all of these issues that we're talking about. It isn't just tires back and forth. It isn't chicken meat back and forth or soybeans back and forth. These are all part of a much larger relationship that will rely on goodwill and understanding and mutual respect in order for us to truly succeed as the world's most important relationship. Staying on U.S.-China, I remember a couple of years ago, Governor Sanford of South Carolina came to my studio and uh, he told me uh, thanks to Chinese uh, textile exports to the U.S., there are a lot of textile workers in his state losing jobs and they blame it on China. So he came to Beijing not to ask China to stop exporting textiles to uh, the United States, but to, in his words, release the steam out of the boiling pot. He was asking Chinese companies such as Hire and Lenovo to invest in his state because as a governor he has to answer to those people who lose their jobs, who uh, eventually decides to vote for him or not. Uh, don't you think that represents another way to go between U.S. and China? On the, on the one hand, there might be job losses in the United States due to Chinese exports, but on the other hand, China can actually create jobs for the U.S. This is an area that represents, again, the new phase of the U.S.-China relationship, one that goes beyond the perception that we're just simply exporting jobs to some other corner of the world. The United States is a very innovative country and it's very good at creating, innovating, and through entrepreneurship developing the industries of tomorrow and the technologies and breakthroughs of tomorrow. And I suspect that if we were to sit here in 20 years, we would see that in the area of biotechnology, medical devices and equipment, energy and energy related technologies that will result in a greener uh, manufacturing capability. We're going to see a lot of those industries take shape and form around work that is being done in the United States. I've seen nascent pockets of this in different parts of the United States. And in China you're going to see a lot of this as well. So the new generation of the U.S.-China relationship will suggest that there's going to be more outbound investment from China into the United States, not probably as much as we're seeing from the United States into China, but certainly more than we've seen historically, and a lot more in the way of collaboration around, I think, some of these industries of tomorrow uh, that are going to blossom and grow in the United States, where there will be huge opportunities for Chinese entrepreneurs, for American entrepreneurs as they look to the future. Well, we have a new U.S. president. Now we have a new ambassador in Beijing. And uh, we're talking about the post-crisis uh, new world, new world order, as mentioned by Secretary Kissinger a while, a while ago. So should we say that U.S.-China relations has also entered into a new era? I think fundamentally we're entering a new phase. And we're 30 years into our formal diplomatic relationship a relationship that has by and large been marked by good cooperation and progress and growth. If there's one word that really summarizes the last 30 years, it is growth. When you look at where we were 30 years ago in terms of bilateral trade and investment, minuscule compared to where we are today and where things are likely to go. So as we look forward, uh, it means that we're going to probably take our bilateral relationship uh, and all of the issues that we've traditionally talked about on a bilateral basis, and we'll continue to talk about those. But now more than ever before, the U.S.-China relationship will be focused on identifying and problem solving around global issues, whether that's global finance and economics, whether it's regional security, whether it's energy and climate change. And as a media guy, we love um, buzzwords, we love catchphrases. When I asked President Obama at the last G20 summit, asking him to give us a catchphrase to characterize U.S.-China relationship, he said he's terrible at catchphrases, uh, and therefore he couldn't give me one. 
but uh, I, I heard that um, as a former governor of Utah, you are very good at catchphrases, both in Chinese and, and English. Um, so there are many catchphrases going on. We have stakeholder, uh, we have cooperation. Uh, President Obama said U.S. China sometimes compete, sometimes cooperate. Uh, we have many catchphrases. Which one do you think best illustrates where we are at now? You know, I, I think all of the catchphrases that we've heard and that you've described marked very important periods of our bilateral relationship, but we're fundamentally entering a new period where all of those that we uh, are familiar with basically don't serve a purpose today. They're anachronistic. I think the best way to describe where we are today in our relationship is Hu Xiang Bang Bang, Hu Xiang Xueshi, Hu Xiang Qin Bu, because that suggests that we're partners, 